it across the fence, grab your shovel, pick up that packet of seeds, and start gardening. We're digging into the tips and techniques that you can use now to get your garden going and growing all summer long. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. When we think about eating local food, it's easy to overlook that the freshest food we can eat can be grown right in our own backyards. Nothing tastes as good as something that you grow yourself, but getting to enjoy the fruits of your labor can be a bit tricky for the first timer or even the seasoned pro. Today we kick off a series of gardening programs that will take us through the growing season. Planting a garden is the easy part, but it takes planning and preparation if you really want your garden to grow. Let's join University of Vermont Extension horticulturalist Leonard Perry, who's at the home of a Vermont garden writer, whose advice to first-time gardeners is, think small. Well, Kathy, your asparagus looks awesome. What's your secret? Thanks, Leonard. Well, it's been here for 20 years. It takes a few Kathy La Liberté is one of those people who was born with a green productive. thumb. Even early in the season, her garden grows with vigor and vitality. The first thing she tells every gardener is to know their limits. How big should one plant on for a garden? Well, I'd say not this big. This is much too big of a garden for most people. In fact, it's too big for me. Um, you can grow an incredible amount of food in a relatively small amount of space. And I'd say a garden that's about a quarter the size would be plenty for the average person. For beginning gardeners, uh, the important thing is to have a garden that you feel really successful about. And a smaller size garden makes you um, be able to keep up with things, keep it weeded, keep the plants happy, um, it's much more satisfying. And uh, having a, a good experience in the garden is, is really important and keep you going for the next years. Before La Liberté sets one seed or one plant in the ground, she puts down cardboard and straw. This practice controls weeds, helps the soil retain moisture, and establishes permanent paths. Using straw instead of hay, eliminates unwanted weeds while creating a great way to lead visitors and growers down the garden path. I guess the first thing is this is all very organized and laid out. Looks like you planned this ahead of time. <laughs> I assume that's a key to get started. Yeah, these, these beds have been here in the same position for about 20 years. Um, I don't till the, the beds, they just are right here and I, I'll show you in a minute how I fork them over. Um, so I don't use any power equipment and I think that that's really the best thing for the soil, that's my philosophy anyway, is just to fork it over and not disturb the structure. Yeah, I've heard some people say they feel the tilling, repeated tilling breaks up that soil structure and so just a hand, especially if you don't have a whole lot. I know some people like the tilling, but yeah. well, depends also, on your philosophy. The, the forking is really easy and, uh, and I'm into easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, good soil too, but um, so how do you keep track of where everything is? It looks like you've got a plan there. I do. Um, I brought my plan today to show you. Um, long winter, there's plenty of time for planning. Um, and what I do is I try to make a really simple plan of the garden every year so I can, uh, it helps me keep track of where different crops have been one year to the next and that way I can rotate where they are located from one year to the next, which so is important you, you, you for certain You mentioned crops. rotation, you don't want to plant the same crop in the same bed. Right, especially for certain things like tomatoes, um, potatoes, uh, things like that, but really I find it's a good idea to rotate everything if you yeah, can. Does that help keep down disease? Is that the, it does, one of the ideas? It does, and also pests, and you'll see that um, I plant in blocks, which I think um, keeps pests a little bit more confused, like they can't just go right down the row of carrots and eat them all. Um, they maybe find some and don't see the other ones. Oh, so you actually will plant uh, some carrots and then some in another exactly. place, not all your carrots right. here. And, and right. I better keep that in mind. I tend to do them <laughs> like most people probably do, put, plant all their tomatoes here and all their peppers there and, yeah, and you kind of mix it up. I think the diversity, plus I really like the way it looks. It looks kind well, of like a Well, that's a good quilt. point too. And of course the way it looks is important to me. Soil preparation is a key to establishing any garden. Beginning gardeners should conduct a soil test. Kits are available through University of Vermont Extension or from many garden centers. Some greenhouses and garden centers offer free tests to customers at the start of the growing season. Even though La Liberté's garden is well established, adding soil amendments is a good way to get a jump start on the season. So you're ready to dig here. This is great soil already. What are you going to do to make it better and get it ready to plant? Well, um, I always add compost before I um, turn over the soil. And so I've got compost and then I put in a little bit of um, all-purpose granular organic fertilizer 
um, just a little bit. The soil's really good here and I've been fertilizing it uh, a little bit every single year for a long time. So you don't want to overdo it, too much nitrogen, you get too much leafy growth and not enough fruit. Um, so I'm pretty conservative with the fertilizer, but I do put on probably an inch or two of compost every year. So that adds some fertility yep. too, so you can back off on the fertilizer. And I guess, depending on people's philosophy on gardening, you could go with a synthetic vegetable garden fertilizer yep. or just a regular all-purpose organic. Okay, so we're ready to dig here. All right, so what I'll do is put on some compost first. And um, I'm not very scientific. The good thing about compost is you don't have to really worry about too much most of the time. So I just sprinkle on, you know, that's... Looks like good stuff. <clears throat> I think one thing about compost, too, I've, I've heard, had some friends that have gotten a good deal, say some free from some farmer yeah, that yeah. hasn't been composted properly, and right. oh, they've ended up with a lot of weed seeds. So I think you want to good, get a good quality wherever you get it. What I do is just lift the soil like this, and that's really all I hmm. do. So you don't turn it over, you I just kind of loosen it. I don't usually turn it over, I usually <clears> just <throat> loosen it. Really weeds don't have too easy of a chance getting established and I plant very intensively so there's mm. not a lot of room. So in once there the either. plants get growing. Yep. Um, it's so not... then I'm going to go through here and I have this I'm just sort of because there are some cl some little cloddy kind of things in mm -hmm. there. I'll just and yeah so breaking just... it up. I guess if you're just starting and you have heavy clay soil you may have to do a little bit you more. You might have to but this is the reward <laughs> um, if you're lucky enough to live in the same place for a period of time. Um, each year you add compost. I have added over time shredded leaves. You know, as the straw rots, it sort of gets incorporated into the bed. So um, this didn't look like this when I started, but what plant wouldn't want to grow in that? When it comes to gardening, timing is everything. What to plant is up to you, but knowing when to plant is essential to making sure you have food all summer. Crops like corn, cucumbers, and carrots are direct seeded. Greenhouses and garden centers sell seedlings like tomatoes and peppers. But these plants can also be started by seed at home. Starting plants from seed is an economic way to plan your garden and the way to have many different and unusual varieties. Well, Kathy, I see some nice earthworms. That must mean your soil is really good. <laughs> I'm very proud of this soil. <laughs> okay, so it looks like it's all ready to plant. I mean, this is just luscious with all this compost in it. Um, what do we have here? Well, I'm um, ready to plant tomatoes. I have a tomato here, Cosmonaut Volkov. This is a, some seeds that a friend of mine gave me. Um, I assume it's Russian. Um, and this plant I started back um, toward the end of, very end of March. And this is about as big as it is right now. Um, started them under lights at first, and then they were in the greenhouse for the last couple weeks. I think that's a good point in itself. Uh, starting from seeds, you can get a lot of varieties. Yeah. You just won't find anywhere I else. Will, I have a lot of different varieties. My problem is I don't need that many tomatoes. There's so <laughs> many interesting ones to try. So what I'm going to do first is um, take off some of the lower leaves here, break them off or cut them off, I suppose, um, because I'm going to bury this plant about two inches um, deeper than, than what you see here. And because tomatoes are one of the plants, uh, tomatillas is another one, that they can root all along their stem. Most plants, like peppers and those kinds of things, you want to plant right at the soil level because if you cover up their um, stem like a tree, you wouldn't cover up a tree you know, stalk because it, it can't root along this. But tomatoes will make all roots along here and more roots mean more nutrition for the plant and more fruit. So especially if you end up with kind of a leggy tomato, that's a good way to yeah. <laughs> make a not so leggy plant this it a little is, deeper. This is one of the not leggy ones. In the greenhouse, yeah. there are some leggier ones. If it's really rooted, root bound, what would you do? I might loosen this up a little bit. I know some people will score it. Um, I don't like to damage the roots in that way. Um, you should try to get your plants in the ground before they get super root bound. Right. Or if you're buying them in, in a nursery, um, you know, look for plants that are not just a total mass of white. If they are, okay, but you want to tease that apart a little bit. Um, and if you have, if you're, if you bought them in a in a peat pot or something like that, um, I'm a, I know they're supposedly uh, decompose in the ground. And I guess they do eventually, but I like to tear that off and um, kind of break it up so that the roots can get out into the soil and get the, um, especially the moisture that they need. Sometimes the peat holds in the roots. I think too long. So I'm going to plant this tomato plant here, right in this spot. I'm going to dig a little place for it. 
loosen up the soil. And I'm going to put in a little bit of fertilizer, about maybe a eighth of a cup or so, and kind of dig that into the root zone. And actually make sure that that area is nice and loose for those young roots to get established. And then I've got a tomato plant here. This is Cosmonaut Volkov. And you see the tomatoes got all these little sprouts at the bottom. And I'm going to tear those off because I'm going to put the tomato in about two inches below up to here. So that's going to go in the ground here, settle it in nice and deep. Some people put them in deeper. I think that this is fine. Um, and bring the soil back around and just lightly press it like that. You don't want to stomp it down and press too tightly. You want to preserve all that nice, those air spaces in among the soil. And then I'm going to water it in with a little bit of dilute organic fertilizer um, and just make sure that water, give it time for the water to get all the way to the bottom of that root ball and get it settled in like that. So the next thing I'm going to do is put on the tomato cage. Some people use steaks and other kinds of things. Um, I like the cages because uh, watch how easy it is. I'm going to put the cage down around the sides, press that in, and you're set. Well, Kathy, I see you've got some cages set up there with some white cloth around them. What's going on there? Well, let me show you what I've done. Um, it's really windy here. It's, it is in many people's gardens, and I find that um, the wind really stresses plants, especially uh, peppers and tomatoes. So once I put the cage on, what I do is I wrap the cages with this garden fabric and put it, keep it nice and tight with uh, regular clothespins, and I leave this on until um, well into June, so maybe three or even four weeks. The plants inside of this little cocoon are protected from the wind, um, from, you know, it sort of moderates the temperature, creates a nice little microclimate that they really like. If frost does threaten, you can take this fabric and, you know, wrap it up over the top and clip it so that they're protected from frost. Um, but, you know, we've waited long enough that it's probably not going to be a frost issue, but um, you'd be surprised how well they grow. In and this is just a thin uh, frost type fabric you can buy in many uh, garden stores yep. that use for frost protection or even insects sometimes. Right. And I guess this is a neat little idea. This is doubled up here just because it's wide and I didn't need it that wide, but um, it isn't really that critical what kind you use, um, just so you're letting some, some air flow through. And you have tomatillas here, you use it for tomatoes, and you mentioned peppers too. You're I also use it for peppers. Not quite as important there. Sometimes I'll put a tunnel over the peppers instead of the cages. Mm -hmm. um, but for these tomatillas, which, it, which in the greenhouse got they're probably a, almost two feet tall, if you just put them out here and, and it was windy, That's a good they'd idea. really get tortured. So I put them out here yesterday, and you can see they look like they've been, they, for all they know, they're still in the greenhouse. We want to thank Kathy for sharing her beautiful garden with us on this fine May day. We'll be back later in the summer to see how these crops have grown and again in the fall. But before we leave today, there's one more aspect of vegetable gardening we really must show, and that's direct seeding into the garden. Now this is uh, what you do for many of the different crops, and today we're going to be working in a raised bed to show this. Raised beds are another aspect of vegetable gardening that's great. Uh, for one thing, I find them, and a lot of gardeners find them a lot easier to maintain. And for reduced mobility, you can make these even higher, and they're a lot easier to work in. So we'll be showing, uh, making uh, two types of sowing today. So for smaller seeds, such as carrots, radishes, lettuce, and others like that, like beets, you want to make a small trench, maybe a quarter to half an inch uh, at most, because these are very small, you want to sow them just under the surface. So um, there are seed sowing devices you can use. I like to just tap out of the packet, and then they uh, come right in. Uh, just tap very gently. If too many do come out, you can move them along the trench, or you'll probably want to come back later and thin these out as they grow up a bit. And then you just cover them up just very gently, like so, and tap them down. So for larger seeds, such as beans, corn, and squash, you can plant these either in a row or you can just push them in like this. It's that easy. About two inches apart uh, for these beans, and you just push them down about one inch deep. 
Just like for seedlings or anything you plant, you want to water right after they're in the ground. But especially for these seedlings, or these seeds, since they're so small, uh, they'll need water every day if it doesn't rain. Just gently to make sure that surface stays wet and they don't dry out. Now if you're unsure about how far apart to plant or how deep, basically all seed packets have directions, so just follow those. Thanks for watching today on Across the Fence. For University of Vermont Extension, I'm Leonard Perry. Across the Fence is brought to you as a public service by University of Vermont Extension and WCAX-TV.